Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Vaughn Edelson. I'm Programs Manager at Genetic Alliance. Welcome to our webinar today, Meeting Health Challenges Through the Arts. We're very excited to have back with us two um, people who presented at our annual conference. So if you were able to join us in, in June, you'll be, uh, might be familiar with these folks. We have Andre Heyer, a storyteller and clinical social worker who has presented trainings in the use of storytelling to foster healing throughout the U.S. and also internationally. His clients include those suffering from trauma, suffering chronic health issues, those in need of crisis intervention. He also teaches sessions on meditation, mindfulness, and imagery. We also have Lucy McCulley, who is artistic director and choreographer and creative energy behind Bowen McCulley Dance. And she is committed to the belief that dance is for everyone. In 2009, she was certified to teach dance for Parkinson's disease courses, free classes for individuals with Parkinson's disease and their care partners. And they now offer um, Dance for PD at three locations around DC. So we're excited to have them with us. Before I hand it over, I will just make a couple quick announcements about the webinar. First of all, it is being recorded. Uh, the archive webinar and all the presentation materials will be available next one, about a week from today. Uh, in addition, everyone on the line is now muted. So we'll have a moderated discussion um, at the end, and we can take questions as we go along to ask questions please type the those into the webinar panel, which should be on the right hand of your screen. Okay, those are all the announcements I have. So with that, I will turn it over to our first presenter, Andre. Hello, good day. I'm looking forward to speaking to you all and um, am interested in um, the questions that you'll be asking and being able to respond. I would like to first share that some of the pictures you will be seeing are from my work in Liberia. And um, it's a group of individuals who have suffered both um, war and torture trauma, as well as individuals who have been trained to do counseling. Now, what I would first like to do is make a distinction between healing versus cure. Um, a lot of times we will be talking today about healing, and, and what does that actually mean? We're not necessarily talking about a cure, which would be a fix, that everything that went wrong is now made right, um, and the physical illness is now taken care of. Healing, on the other hand, is the sense that things have fallen apart, things have broken apart, and there's the need to bring things back together in a new way. In other words, there's been a story that this person has lived out, and that story has fallen apart, and that they've been living, and there's the need to reconstruct that story, to make it new. Um, I saw that with my own mother, that she was diagnosed with cancer in that three-year period. She reconstructed the meaning of her life and her understanding of her life, even though eventually she did die of cancer. But there was a new meaning. It was healing on so many levels. And actually, I think it prolonged her life in, in the sense of being able to, to come together in herself and who she was. Now, also, there's a sense that the art, when we talk about art, it's sort of like art versus science. Well, we're finding out that that distinction, that sometimes that the arts are there sort of as a supplement, um, something in addition, something to add some pleasure but not very meaningful, is maybe being put into um, question um, as we're understanding gene expression and neurogenesis. So there's three um, parts that in terms of this new understanding in science that are important for my work. And the first is that novel and enriching life experiences like the arts and physical exercise can activate neurogenesis. In other words, we can create new brain cells. We can create new synapses by novel experience. Um, one of the places where that's been um, documented is with religious orders, especially here in Minnesota, where the religious nuns, um, after dying, 
they would do brain autopsies and what they would discover all sorts of lesions. But when they looked at the phenomenology part of their life, their activities and that, they were functioning normally. And they believed it was because they continued in enriching life experiences in the arts, in writing, in all these kind of things. And part of the reason for that is that the, such experiences can turn on gene expression within minutes and throughout the whole brain and body to guide growth, development, and healing. Um, and another aspect is that as we image and we work with the images that our brain are capable of producing our minds, that things are going on on that most basic level, that most basic level of, of, of genes expressing themselves, of, of healing, of, of growth and development. Now, these discoveries, in light of that, for my own art, which is storytelling, um, what has become important is, you know, what are the ways in which we tell stories and, and create stories? Also, um, what are the cycles that we can use in terms of that? We know in terms of we have a basic rest and activity cycle. We know that there are creative cycles. Um, and what do these ultradian, these short cycles, have to do with the healing process and how can we connect into those processes in order to, um, to promote that gene expression, to promote those healings. So we're at the beginning stages of understanding that, but we see in sports medicine a lot of development in that. But I think in the arts, we're at the beginning stages of recognizing that those cycles and the way in which we're doing it, the rhythms of learning and creativity, do make a difference, that they can act, we can learn to activate. It's not just a matter of going in and doing our artwork. It's actually the way in which we're doing it. Now, these pictures that you're seeing, um, I utilized a lot of those kind of cycles between rest and activity um, in terms of arousal, in terms of, of looking at the creative cycle and collecting data, getting in touch with their, the sensations that they are experiencing, getting into the data, and then rest periods in which um, there's quiet time to reflect, incubation time, going back and forth. Now, the basic rest and activity cycle could last from 90 minutes to 120 minutes. So a lot of my classes around story and the utilization of story work on those cycles and understanding that if I have a period of activity of 60 minutes or so, then having a half hour of rest or quieter time is actually helping the process of learning going from short-term memory to long-term memory. In terms of story, um, working with um, neuropsychologists and um, therapists at St. John's Stroke Center in Missouri, um, we spent two days looking at different types of storytelling techniques and the ways in which um, these techniques might affect clients and patients. And what, um, in the discussion, what we came up with and what has, has actually been um, written about afterwards um, in, from other perspectives in terms of science and of of the science of storytelling, I think also apply to the arts. And the first one is that it creates a sense of belonging and support. Um, there's a sense of um, a sense that when stories are shared, people are coming together. We know that we see the same thing in um, Lucy's work in terms of dance, where people are coming together around a particular issue, and even if that's not the focus of the dance or the storytelling, that there is the sense of belonging and support. Further, what story does, it helps to integrate the meaning. Story is more than just a series of events. Um, what story helps to do is construct those events into a meaningful way, structuring their experience into a meaningful way, placing meaning onto what's happening with them, why is this happening. 
I also, in terms of using story in, in storytelling, is it allows people to deal with the grief and loss of, of what has happened to them. It helps them, you know, in that, that structure of meaning, this has happened, and this is what I can do with this. This is what I've learned from this. These are the things that help me in relationship to that which I, the challenges that I'm facing. Also, um, the neuropsychologists were particularly interested in the improvement in cognitive skills, um, including memory retention, decision making, and organizational skills. That the actual process of structuring into story and the telling of, of, of story is actually a structuring process. And in, in doing that structuring process, uh, there is that reorganization. And if you remember, going back is that when we have a memory, when we reframe um, something, that is a new memory and it, and it causes a molecular structure, a new, new formation that allows transformation to take place. And so that um, process then actually helps in the process of of those cognitive skills, those organizational skills. And including in terms of storytelling is the ability for verbal and written skills, the relearning. Um, we all want to tell a story. I remember when I was in pastoral work, um, there was an individual in his mid-70s who um, did not speak a lot. He had, stroke, had a stroke. He was in, um, very articulate in the sense of clarity of speech. And people would get impatient and move on, so he wouldn't talk much. But what happened is that I began to see that he had stories to tell, and I would listen to his stories. And even though it took a long time, what happened over a period of time as he told those stories, I could see that his skills were actually improving in terms of his verbal skills and his ability on a more interpersonal relationship um, to communicate more with other people. Um, also, in terms of story, it improves the perceptual and interpretive skills. And I would say this is with all the arts. You know, the arts are about interpretation. They are about that personal perception of, you know, what am I seeing? How am I seeing? It guides us through as we, because we've become attentive to our movement or to the breaststroke or to the words that we're saying. It, it improves our attentiveness in terms and our consciousness of of what is taking place and not only taking place within ourselves but out in the world. You know, the, the willingness to see, to to be responsive, to mimic, all those kind of things. Um, and it's also, and most importantly, in terms of, of this process in, of healing, when I said the story changes when someone suffers an illness or faces the challenges of an illness, their self-perception, who they are in the world, things that were able to be done before are not able to be done now. A simple walk um, is no longer a simple walk. It's, it's a difficult walk. It's a walk. And it's a ride in a wheelchair, not a walk. Um, so looking at that, you know, it changes the meaning. And so the working with the arts, the working with story and storytelling allows the person to reestablish this personal identity, no longer to, um, say, like with Lucy's work, from Parkinson diseased person to I am a dancer. I am a person who dances with others. I am a person who comes together with people who are telling stories and sharing stories. I am a storyteller. I am a story listener. I am a person who identifies with these individuals who have gone through these experiences of growing up. Um, so it gives that kind of perspective. It starts giving this sense of of who I am now in the world. And in the example that I gave earlier in terms of my mother, in terms of the cancer in that three and a half years, um, she went from being a person whose life 
seemed to fall apart to this is a, I am a person who is capable of living my life even in the face of the challenge of my cancer, that this did not end my life. I have made this choice. And so I noticed what I saw was the strengthening of her, the, the ways in which she, she interacted with people, her ability to speak clearer in terms of what her ideas were. And one of the things I noticed the most was the, the ability to be very clear about what she thought in her opinion um, became much stronger in the process. Now, I mentioned the, the basic rest and activity cycles and its connection to the creative cycles. And, and this basic rest and activity cycle is like 90 to 120 minutes. And as I said, in these pictures um, that you're seeing, you can see that sometimes they're writing, sometimes they're up and um, speaking and chanting back and forth um, in terms of call and responses. Um, sitting with each other, sharing the story, and then at times just sitting there at rest, quietly ruminating, much more in terms of the creative cycle and where you data collect and you incubate the ideas and then you gain that insight and once you take that deep breath and say, okay, what do I have? That moment of relaxation almost. And then there's this insight and then the, the relaxing and, yeah, this is how it works, yeah, and the rethinking, which then causes the arousal and so back and forth, very similar to the basic rest and activity cycle. So one of the things that when people utilize the arts is to really be able to look at what are the cycles that I'm involved with? Am I really helping these individuals in terms of that rest and activity cycle to connect with their creative cycles? Um, those kind of cycling then prevents us from, I think, at times overdoing it or underdoing it. I think we often have a tendency to um, underuse, utilize a, a technique or a method or overutilize it, tiring everyone out by the end, which doesn't really help in the healing process, but learning about those. Um, there's an author, um, Ernest Rossi, who has the uh, text on um, the psychobiology of gene expression, where he goes into details about many of those kinds of um, cycles and how to utilize those cycles. I would also say that one of the ways of analysis, analyzing my activities is, is by using multi-intelligence theory and looking at saying, who, what part of this human being that I'm working with am I engaging with? Um, and so I look at those aspects of the spatial, the verbal, the music, body kinesthetic, um, the logical, mathematical, and then how do I set them up in terms of the intrapersonal, the inner work that the person needs to do to structure meaning and and knowledge and understanding and interpersonal, the relational. And you can see in these pictures that are showing that I have them at times spending time by themselves for the interpersonal work, the writing, utilizing the verbal. But you also see the body kinesthetic. You see them in activity. You see them dancing. You see them in that movement. So I look at those seven intelligences and I ask myself, how can I engage them? in those processes while I'm doing the work that I'm doing. So that when I'm doing the story work, it's more than just um, sitting there saying words. It's activities and movements that enhance that learning process to enhance gene expression, which then enhances the possibilities of healing, of people feeling better. And one of the things that I found in working in the library and also Thailand and also here in the States with um, those who are suffering chronic um, and acute illness is that after a, a training event or a, a workshop like this is that the pain level would go down. That was the particular instance where pain may have been at seven or eight, it would go down to three or four. 
also in terms of their mood, there would be a shift in mood. The last thing to look at in terms of the cycle is that how many times do I engage them in the cycle? In Liberia, Thailand, in my work with chronic illness, I find that going through these cycles over a period of time, four to eight weeks, and helping them once a week, twice a week, to go through a cycle of creativity through storytelling and the movement um, in that is part of the process of also healing so that it gets ingrained that those kind of responses um, become more in tune and, and they become congruent and just part of the person, the habit in a sense. Now, some of this um, has been more and more documented. There's a lot of research that is going on now where story in particular with like narrative um, exposure therapy has shown to make a difference in those who are suffering post-traumatic stress disorder in terms of the scans and looking at how the brain is functioning and between the different parts of the brain and the cortex and that, and actually shows that there is actually movement and change. And so the movement, understanding the cycles, um, connecting with the different intelligences are all part of the process of creating the meaning uh, with a person's life that does more than just a philosophical kind of abstract kind of thing, but can actually affect the body and gene expression and um, the ability of the body to heal. And with that, um, I'm going to go into mute, and um, um, Vaughn will introduce the next um, speaker. Thank you. Thank you, Andre. Um, if anyone has any questions, you can type them in now. Um, but otherwise, we will take questions for both Andre and Lucy um, after we've gone through both presentations. Um, so with that, I'll let Lucy uh, introduce her team here, and I'll get the pictures now. Thank you, Vaughn. I'm Lucy Bowen-McCauley, and I'm, I'm the Artistic Director of Bowen-McCauley Dance. We're based in the Washington, D.C. area. I have with me today the Executive Director, Ricky Marion of Bo Macaulay Dance, and also Michelle DeFremery. She recently joined the company and is our Outreach Associate. Uh, we, uh, the company is a professional company, and we also believe that dance is for everyone, and we like to bring dance to people of all ages and abilities in communities wherever we go. So what I'm going to talk about today is the Dance for Parkinson's Disease program. Um, this program was founded by the marvelous Mark Morris Dance Group at, based in Brooklyn, New York in 2001. Um, Oli Westheimer of the Brooklyn Parkinson's Group um, came over to the Mark Morris Dance Group brand new studios in Brooklyn and suggested that they start a class for people with Parkinson's disease, uh, something they had never thought about or done before, and two Mark Morris dancers, uh, David Leventhal and John Higginbotham, uh, decided to try their hand at the class and learned a lot about the disease and started a once-a-month class that then has grown to uh, once a week, and now they have even more classes offered up at Juilliard and several during the week at the, their studios. It's an incredible program. Um, and I took the training with them in 2006. Um, they've offered, very generously offered a training to um, dancers and other caregivers ever since they started the program. Um, and then I started our program here in the Washington area four years ago. We offer these classes uh, in collaboration uh, with the Parkinson Foundation of the National Capital Area. They support this program, and we are delighted to be able to offer the program in Silver Spring at the Maryland Youth Ballet and in Arlington at Kenmore Middle School. Uh, we also have a program that's a Goodwin House at their two facilities for their um, residents. So the uh, program um, is its an incredible program for people with Parkinson's disease, and they're also invited to bring their caregivers or family members uh, or a friend to a class that is actu an actual dance class. Um, we start in a chair, uh, in chairs in a circle, 
Uh, we do traditional warm-up exercises for dancers in a chair. We also use um, a lot of images and, of course, uh, music to support the movement. Um, we go then from the chair to actually some standing up of positions at the bar or using some other support material to work on uh, some balance and to learn other dance moves to standing. Uh, sometimes we have people who are not able to stand and they continue to do the class in a wheelchair or with a walker or with an assistant. Um, and then we actually end the class with moving across the floor um, to, and we choreograph. They, um, end up learning dances sometimes that are in a circle, sometimes in a line, and we found that this also increases the sense of whole joy and community when we do things together, touching each other, dancing in a circle, holding hands. Um, the class is one of the highlights of my life, um, and I can't explain um, all the reasons why it benefits people with Parkinson's disease um, but we do see many. Um, the program uh, is not to make it to focus on the disease at all. And that's probably the biggest thing I notice when we start dancing. Uh, people have arrived at class, um, often having trouble getting to class. Um, walking is difficult. Sometimes speech is difficult. Um, the, the disease affects people very differently, which is also a challenge in the class. Um, but by the time we're 15 minutes into the class, I see a lot of the symptoms from the disease dissipate for a while. Um, and people start to feel better and more engaged. The disease is very isolating, and so the class also brings people together in a very safe environment, um, safe in both ways. Um, we're very careful with their bodies and make sure no one falls, but also a safe place where it's, they're dancing with other people with Parkinson's disease. So it's not like going alone to a dance class where you're the single person with a disease. Um, so there's a real sense of camaraderie, um, and mutual understanding. Um, we also using the use of music, which Dr. Oliver Sacks has written a lot about. The book Musicophilia comes to mind. Using music and rhythm uh, helps uh, the dancers to coordinate their movement. Um, but I think dancing really takes it, you know, a notch beyond that because we use imagery. We're also sort of overloading their brains, trying to get them to uh, remember movement and follow along. Um, so I would say the, the disease has to take a real back seat in the dance class, and that's the joy of it because we, they're, they're not people with Parkinson's disease. They're dancers when they're in class. Um, and I, another great benefit, I think, is that we have professional dancers. I'm in the class, and I have my dancers uh, assisting me, and that they're getting to learn dance from professionals, which I think really heightens the experience. I thought um, Michelle de Fremery might want to chime in here. Um, she's had some uh, a one year experience uh, teaching this, and so I'm going to turn it over you to, Mich to you, Michelle. Thanks, Lucy. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, I had also the pleasure of taking the training up uh, with Mark Morris, and actually started a class uh, in collaboration with Overlook Hospital, Atlantic Neuroscience Institute in New Jersey, in Summit, New Jersey, and we um, held the class at the Connection in Summit. Um, and I got to experience it there and got the class going there, and this year have moved down to Washington, D.C., and, and pleased to be working with Lucy um, in her PD classes, but also as a dancer. Um, my interest before going into dance was in psychology, and I did some work in Alzheimer's. And I was always, I've always been curious about the mind-body connection, and dance with Parkinson seems to be a place where that is very relevant. And so to that goal, um, I've started to try and gather a research team to look at dance and other, we're calling them observations of daily living, as coined by Robert Wood Johnson, and how those affect people's experience with Parkinson's disease and maybe in the future other conditions. The idea being that using technology, um, iPads and, and things like that, that patients can now take an active role in telling physicians uh, their experience. Often when you sit down in front of a doctor, uh, you forget what's happened to you in the course between the two appointments. 
And so this would be a way to increase the communication between doctor and patient and hopefully have the patient see that they can have a role in their own well-being and their own care and change the progress potentially of their disorder. So we're working with Atlantic Neuroscience Institute and Dr. Roger Curlin, a movement disorder specialist there, and a patient advocate here in the D.C. area, Perry Cohen, um, who also has health systems and planning evaluation. He is also, sorry, a health system and planning evaluation special, professional. And we have our tech team out in the San Francisco Bay Area. So that seems to be hopefully where things will go because, like Lucy said, Parkinson's is a disease that affects people very individually. And what helps one person may help another or it may not. And so this is the idea is to create a way that somebody can see how they're affecting a change in their own health and then hopefully in the long run, as we look back at it with research, research can see um, and we can guide our research to what's working for the patient. Thanks, Michelle. Um, I want to applaud the Mark Morris Dance Group for uh, getting the word out. I often get the question about where can you find a dance for, for PD program, and there are 40 communities now around the world offering this program. Um, and so if you are interested, you can go to, um, if, if you're in our area, you can go to our website, www.dmdc.org. Um, and then if you want to, are not in our area, you can go to www.danceforpd.org and you'll find out where there's a class near you. And I highly encourage um, anyone, if you know someone with Parkinson's disease or you have it yourself, that you um, look into these classes. I'll say one of the challenges is getting people to first come to the class to come out of the isolation. Often um, people who take our classes have never danced before and feel that they never had any sort of coordination, um, and it doesn't matter. Just come to the class and, and you will have an amazing experience. Um, the, one of the unique things about our program here is that um, we have also choreographed for the Dance for PD Dancers. Um, we have a documentary that was uh, produced by Last Name Left Productions um, that we're going to show you in just a moment about the making of the dance, If I Can't Dance. Um, Grace Griffith sang the song, and she also has Parkinson's disease. We did this at the Kennedy Center, uh, and we choreographed the piece over several months and put the various classes together from three different locations at that point um, to perform with the uh, professional company on the Millennium Stage at the Kennedy Center. So we have a documentary that sort of tracks how all this happened, and within that you'll, you can see a little bit about how the class runs and what it would look like, um, and then we'll be back to talk to you more about the program. As soon as I go in we, and we start doing it, I forget about the Parkinson's in a way and, and, the, and the disorder that I have. And, um, and it, it's like the, an evil is blown out of me. It's, it's teaching us something about love and letting go and to surrender. There's something magical about being with other people who understand what you're going through. I can't explain it. A new me has, has come around just for the short time that we do it. We do warm-ups and I see the lift and they start to think of breathing as another thing. They become aware of their body as not the enemy but as this tool for expression. So we warm up and they start to feel better just like all of us need a warm-up. We're dancing. Even if we're in a chair, we're dancing. And that's very joyful and I think joy is a direct antidote to Parkinson's. It's important to find a type of exercise that the patient or the person really enjoys doing. And what better way to enjoy yourself than putting on a record and dancing? Then they get warmed up and they do harder things and then we start to do things you know, up on our feet and then moving across the floor. So someone who's come in having lots of difficulty getting here and walking and balancing 
can be going across the floor doing a combination with spirit and joy and no sense of falling. And There's nothing like performing. That's, I, I go back to dance is a performing art. So we're sharing with them not just the class and the training that dancers get, but my company, we're always building towards the next performance. And there's nothing like that performance rush and the applause and feeling like you you went out there and did it, it's it's a it's another element way beyond what you do in class. You'll never get that in a classroom with mirrors and things. You need to have the stage, the lights, the audience to get that. And I wanted to share that with my PD dancers. There's a tremendous energy created in just realizing you're part of this choreography that people are going to see that you know, flows in from the sides, crosses in the middle, goes back out, flows in, crosses, interweaves, moves together. And, uh, and it's just exciting. You know, it's kind of like I've never been part of that. And um, I'm ready to give it a try. And I'm proud of all the others doing it too. And it's beautiful. To say that there's an interest would be an understatement. To say that there's a, a, a rapidness high energy uh, by the group of people who will dance. Um, you know, it comes from the heart. It's, it's about being proud. Oh, it, it feels fantastic knowing like 10 years from now you can say you performed at the Kennedy Center. And uh, just knowing that I can do, you know, I'll be doing the best I can and going up on stage in front of, uh, you know, hundreds of people or how many are going to be there. It's fantastic. It, it's a dream come true. There's over 200,000 people in this area who have Parkinson's disease. So my next dream, I guess, is to reach more people. Movement, dance, exercise is wonderful for Parkinson's patients. So I think you'd be very surprised tonight when you see my friends from the Parkinson's Foundation do, spreading their stuff. I used to think pain was a measure of how much you loved. I used to forsake earthly pleasures for God up above. And I take the weight of the world and I drag it around. Stars would be singing, but I wasn't hip to the sound. And I love the tortured artist in all of her glory. But if I can't dance, I don't want to be part of that story. Sing with it. If I can't dance, if I can't dance, if I can't dance, if I can't dance, I don't want to be part of that story. Life is a cup of water from which we're all drinking. Whether it's half full or empty depends on your thinking. Cause beauty and terror are racing wherever you go. And if I can dance, I don't want to be part of that show. If I can dance, if I can dance, if I can dance, I don't want to be part of that show. Gotta look suffering square in the eye. You can't turn your face from the rain. A world of wonder can pass you right by when you're only focusing in on the pain. Stand isn't easy when cool is in fashion. The fate of the
this world is dependent on living with passion. And I'll stand for change next to any old woman or man. But if I can dance, I don't want to be part of that plan. If I can dance, if I can dance, if I can dance, I don't want to be part of that plan. I wanted to turn over, um, turn you over to Ricky Marion. Hi, this is Ricky. Um, I began with Bowen McCulley as the executive director almost a year ago, and one of my first experiences with the company was attending a Dance for PD class. It was something I did my first week, and as I watched the class students arriving and excited to see each other, greeting each other, catching up um, over the past week, my immediate impression was that this was a class that had created a really valuable social network. Um, but as um, the class began and progressed, I was really impressed at the, the transformation that I witnessed as the students became more joyful and had more freedom in their movement and um, more confidence. So it was definitely a very um, powerful experience for me to see the students um, go through that um, progression from the beginning of the class um, through the end of the class. And I have a short uh, testimonial that was provided by Phyllis Richmond, who's a member of our local Dance for PD program that I'd like to share. Exercise for me has never been fun. With Parkinson's, it became increasingly a necessity just as it became even more chore. Even the few physical activities I once enjoyed, cycling and dancing, looked no longer possible. I was wrong. Lucy showed me and much of my PD support group that we could still move to the music. More significantly, we could be moved by the music. No matter how clumsy we were as we came through the door, every one of us left our inhibitions back with our shoes and canes, and for one magical hour a week became a dance troupe. We learned ballet moves. We forgot how stiff we were. We applauded our fellow dancers' hesitant first steps. We saw how our own strength and flexibility improved, even though we were having fun. Middle-aged and seniors, men and women, Newly diagnosed and nearly immobilized, we all left feeling that there was life in these uncooperative muscles yet. Um, I think that perfectly summarizes the experience that many people have with the program and definitely something that I found really um, touching and rewarding to see um, firsthand. I think another special thing to mention about the classes is that they are free and you don't have to pre-register. You can really just show up at any of our local, at Kenmore Middle School in Arlington or at Maryland Youth Ballet in Silver Spring and just drop in and join the class. So it's definitely um, something you can easily, um, easily participate in without a lot of, of pre-planning. Thank you, Ricky. I think we're going to turn it over to question time now. Vaughn. Thank you. Thank you to all of our presenters this afternoon. Um, we have several questions, and please keep them coming. Um, again, you can type in the questions using the webinar panel on the right hand of your screen. So, so far we have a couple for each of our presenters. Um, Andre, who is doing the research on storytelling? Andre, are you still with us? Lucy, I'll ask you guys uh, some questions first um, while we get Andre back. Um, are there dance programs for people with Alzheimer's? And a similar question, um, so really, are there, do you know of any dance programs for people with other specific conditions? Um, I, I know some people have shown interest in doing, um, starting a class for people with Alzheimer's out in only um, Virginia but I don't know if that class has started. 
I'm not um, so aware of other uh, classes with specific diseases, but um, I'm sh they are probably out there, but I'm not an authority on that. And I am back. Okay. Excellent. So the question was, who is doing the research on storytelling? Um, what we're seeing right now in terms of story and the use of narrative are throughout the medical establishment in terms of narrative medicine and nursing medicine. And um, one of the arenas that I have been connected with or, or have watched with interest is in the area of narrative exposure therapy, which is basically a pure um, storytelling process in which individuals come in and um, tell their story and it builds. And over an eight to 10 session period, they continue to work with the story. Um, one of the individuals, as I mentioned before, who is doing a lot of research in terms of the arts in general, which includes the art of storytelling is Ernest Rossi um, and his book on um, the psychobiology of gene expression goes into the utilization of the arts and therapy. So there's um, a number of people who are in the beginning stages in the last two to three years um, and those are some of the arenas that I've been utilizing to, to support me in my work. Thanks. Um, Lucy, a couple of questions on, uh, for you related to cancer, actually. Um, one individual said, this was very inspiring, so thank you. And does anyone know if dance therapy like this has been used for cancer? And in addition, would your dance program consider coming to York, Pennsylvania for an afternoon breast cancer retreat? So I think um, you have a lot of potential to expand this to other conditions if you are interested. Yeah, um, we do get asked about this, and being a small company, um, we are focused on the dance for PD, and uh, we also have a, a lot of outreach for uh, students that wouldn't be exposed to dance um, without um, a, our assistance. But um, we do know Dan Burkholder is in this area, in the Washington, D.C. area, working with people with cancer, I think through maybe a hospital, maybe um, Lombardi Cancer Institute, we think. Um, so you could look uh, that up. A Dance USA might be a good resource um, if you go to the Dance USA website um, to find out what other programs might be offered nationally. Um, does that answer that whole question? Yeah. Exactly. Okay, but and we we just don't feel we couldn't take on a lot of other um, uh, other diseases, but I have every great belief that dance would would help those with other diseases. Thank you. A couple um, similar questions for both Lucy and Andre. So first, Lucy, how can you offer dance for PD classes for free? And then kind of a companion question um, for both Lucy and Andre, are any of these expressive arts interventions billable? Um, I'll go first, I guess, Andre. The Parkinson Foundation of the National Capital Area supports our programs at in Silver Spring and Arlington, and Goodwin House supports the program for the residents there at Goodwin House. So um, the Mark Morris Dance Group, when they started their classes, felt that they should not charge people with Parkinson's disease and uh, have encouraged anyone who takes the training when they go forth and, and start a class to not charge people. So we find our, um, a way to fund it through the foundation and through grants. And I give training to my dancers to uh, be able to assist me. We've had a few dancers who have gone through the training program at the Mark Morris Dance Group. <coughs> Yeah, yeah, for my work, um, I'm associated with a organization here in uh, Minneapolis called Pathways, and it's a group that gives services to people who are suffering from chronic and acute illness, and they provide space, and most of the work there that I've done has been volunteer work. Um, in other words, I'm a provider, and um, they give me the space to work, and I work along with the other professionals who are there. 
Also, um, I do get money at times for training and um, have done things for like the Minnesota Social Work Association um, and at St. John's I was paid. So when I do trainings for professionals, I tend to get paid when I am doing the workshops and that a lot of times that I am doing work um, in terms of, of um, volunteer or somehow connected with an association like Genetic Alliance. Um, in terms of billable hours, um, the, in terms of my story work, the story is so intrinsic to the therapeutic process in terms of doing psychotherapy um, in my work that um, it's pretty much in relationship to individual one-on-one -on -one kind of work and that can and is um, billable. Um, also, um, going back to the previous questions of research, one of the um, sites I would um, encourage people to look at is um, the Healing Story Alliance, the Healing Story Alliance. And that is a website that is dedicated to the use of story on all sorts of different levels, and you will find a number of articles in terms of of the research and approaches that our individuals are doing. And it's, um, if you Google it, um, Healing Story Alliance, that's one of a very good um, place to look. Thank you. We can compile these uh, links that the presenters have been mentioning, these organizations, and uh, make that available to all the participants. Another um, suggestion came in for resources on dance and cancer that you can contact the American Dance Therapy Association. Um, a few more questions here. So do either of you know if storytelling and dramatic expression have been incorporated in rehab facilities anywhere in the U.S.? Hmm. Andre, I don't, I, don't, I don't really know. Yes, I think that... Um, the, the situation at Pathways is, in a sense, um, that kind of meeting point of people who are dealing with the physical illnesses and chronic illnesses, and we have therapeutic, you know, crossover. We do have a number of hospitals now that are entering into the field of holistic complementary medicine, um, and there are two hospitals in particular, Mayo and Rochester, and um, let's see, Northwestern Chicago, on Chicago, I'm tr trying to remember the correct name of the hospital, but they have holistic um, departments there that are utilizing um, all the expressive arts as well as um, the complementary um, um, medicine kind of things such as meditation and that. So um, I know that part of my reason to be at St. John Stroke Center in Missouri and Springfield was for um, that kind of crossover to take, um, to take place with the individuals who were working with um, the individuals who had suffered stroke. So those are some of the places that I know of. Um, and to further that, um, speaking of holistic programs in hospitals, I know that Oak Hospital in Summit in Jersey has um, a very broad wellness program for their cancer um, department as well as their movement disorders. Dr. Roger Curlin is starting a wellness and support program for those with movement disorders. So they also have a large integrated medicine department. Thank you. Um, for for Lucy, uh, you all, have the long-term benefits of dance for people with uh, PD been studied and documented? If so, if there's evidence that shows the value, this can really help move the arts more mainstream into healthcare and preventative approaches. Um, yes, there are, and there's studies in the work. There is one study that's been done. It's completed um, in the UK. Um, and uh, when I went back to the Mark Morris um, dance group this past spring to work with them uh, in a training, um, the uh, therapist uh, reported, but it was a very small study. It was a small pool, pool of people, but it did um, show us the results that we kind of already know, that people's balance got 
better, their flexibility got better. Um, sometimes uh, facial muscles that have been frozen got awakened, um, but especially um, their moods better, um, sleeping better. They, they tracked a lot of different things. And, um, but again, it was a small study. I think Johns Hopkins has something in the works, and uh, Michelle's going to chime in in a moment about this. But um, I mean, there's no doubt that the, the dance class has some healing qualities. Um, it's not therapy, but um, there, we do some healing through the classes. I, some of my students um, tell me about some lasting effects through the week. For example, um, one came in and said, wow, all week I could lean over and turn off my alarm clock in the morning without pain in my right shoulder um, because of your class last week or something. But um, we're not curing, um, but we are healing, and um, there are some lasting effects that I know people are trying to, um, to quantify. Um, but Michelle also can speak about it. Um, from, from just talking to people in the field, and this is certainly not coming from you know, personal expertise, but one of the challenges is finding a standard that measures quality of life that seems to be true to the experience of the participant. So that's one of the challenges is coming up with um, something that's agreed upon within the, society, uh, the scientific community um, that shows and speaks to genuinely the experience of the patient's quality of life. And I think that part of the issue right now is that it's only in the last five to ten years that there's been a refocusing in on the importance of the arts and because it's always, in a sense, been almost a secondary kind of out there on the peripheral um, that it was there, it gave some comfort, it was a nice thing to do. I think it's only as we've been beginning to understand gene expression in neurogenesis and the mind-body links that um, we're now developing the tools of how do we measure this, how do we work in terms of understanding what is working. And I think that probably one of the areas that's happening is the ability to scan the brain and to see when the brain is functioning, when it is and how it is, what and the processes that are going on, and then being able to extrapolate from that. Okay, then we have a final couple of questions here. Um, for Andre, have you worked with specific uh, genetic disease groups on storytelling, and then as well, how can people who are interested in storytelling participate in your, in your workshops or training? Okay. Um, the, say the first part of the question again. I'm sorry. Just have you worked with any uh, specific? Oh, yes, yes. Um, Many of the individuals that I work with at Pathways have um, different um, genetic diseases, including Parkinson, um, and different forms of, of fibromyalgia. Um, oh, I could go down the list. In, in many cases, genetic diseases that I just have never heard about. And what I try to do is to, um, in a sense, m maybe like Lucy, I'm saying we don't focus in on the disease, but we focus in on the human being and the gathering in the process of the story. And so a lot of times I will hear, you know, that a person has epilepsy or they have this or they have that. My focus has primarily been on, you know, what is the process that we can do together and work together. And that usually um, includes someone mentioning what they have but um, immune disease um, or whatever it happens to be, but I, I don't concentrate on that, but I have worked with it. In terms of training, um, people need to contact me, and I usually set up trainings with organizations. Um, I don't usually go out you know, uh, um, and do trainings um, on my own or you know, advertising. I usually try to work as close as I can with an organization. Um, the last one that I worked with was Fraser, which works with um, children with autism and family and working with them with some narrative kind of approaches. That's it. 
And our final question uh, for both presenters, we've spoken to this a little bit about physician education, but is there any uh, larger effort uh, being done to educate physicians, um, physical and occupational therapists regarding the benefits of and referral to the arts for patients? Um, it's kind of in competition to the drug companies who yeah. you know, have the market pretty well covered. Yeah. Um, do you want to go first, Andre? Um, I think that one of the arenas is um, the work of Sharon in, at, the at Columbia in New York and looking at the whole issue of narrative medicine and bringing that in in terms of physician training and in the process in literature and arts. And there are um, development of programs at Columbia, um, University of Pennsylvania, um, Abraham Verghese um, and others who are saying we need to bring the arts into and they, their particular interest is in literature, but it's evolving. And I think that some of the hospitals were like Mayo here in Rochester and, um, and Northwestern are some of the hospitals that are saying we're making this part of, of our education. And at the University of Minnesota, there's a healing and spirituality um, department, and then they are doing crossover work continuously in terms of educating. And the purpose of Pathways, too, is to educate physicians in the medical profession in terms of the role of arts in complementary medicine. So those are some of the arenas that things are going on that I know of. I'm done. Okay. Um, well, we um, well one way we were trying to get the word out was by being involved with the Genetic Alliance and showing our documentary at their gene screen this past June. Um, getting the word out to neurologists is high on our list, and I know that um, our other partners around the the country um, are trying to do so as well. Where whenever we go out on tour, we offer um, free master classes to people with Parkinson's disease. Um, and we try to get the word out to whatever community we're, we're visiting. Um, the Parkinson Foundation of the National Capital Area also has a newsletter um, that we, they've done several stories about the dance program. Um, there are some neurologists on the, on the board who I've talked to, um, and the foundation um, you know, truly supports this program, and we're really grateful for that. They have um, lots and lots of support groups, and I've done um, visited many of the support groups and also done speaking at um, one of their symposiums. Um, so, tr you know, tr but Johns Hopkins also has, uh, is developing some program to um, learn more about the benefits of the arts with disease. Um, yes, and uh, my, uh, Ricky, I'll turn it over to you. I was just going to mention, um, Lisa Traeger did a, or I'm not sure if that's, that's right, I think I'm missing the, the name, but there was a recent piece in Dance Studio Life um, magazine, their May-June issue, that covered um, the Dance for PD program and um, discussed the, the program's origins with Mark Worth Dance Group and also the work that Lucy does locally in the Washington, D.C. region. And that was um, some nice exposure for the program um, that, that led to people contacting us for more information. So that was really helpful to have that sort of um, press about the work we do also. Thank you so much. It's 105, so we have to wrap up our webinar today, but I want to um, just express great thanks to all of our presenters today for your continued involvement with Genetic Alliance. I know if you have uh, any other questions for them, look them up. Um, they'll be happy to continue the conversation. A few announcements before signing off. The recording will be available next week on the Genetic Alliance website as well as in our resource repository. Um, so you can send it around to anyone who missed who missed this today. And I will just put in a, um, a quick plug for the Gen Genetic Alliance 25th anniversary celebration coming up two, in two weeks on September 22nd here in Washington, D.C. at the National Geographic Museum. Um, we're going to have a wonderful innovators exhibit, which we will be featured in. Um, so if you are in or will be in the D.C. area in two weeks, please come join us for that celebration. Thank you. Have a great day. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.